Good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets and this monthly non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday the 1st of September 2017 with me Michael Hewson and my colleague in Canada Toronto Colin Szynski. Good morning everyone. Before we get started a few housekeeping rules obviously we have to bring up the disclaimer um, which basically just um, uh, tells you tells you guys out there guys ladies and gents out there that none of what we're going to be talking about today should be construed as direct trading advice that's not what we're into but certainly what we will be hoping to do is to try and basically paint some color on the numbers that are coming out in 14 minutes time namely the non-farm payrolls headline number but not just that it's the it's the internals of the report so um, the wages numbers the the labor participation rate numbers and the unemployment rate numbers and the potential effects that they're likely to have on US monetary policy going forward given the fact that we have a Fed meeting later this month. We also have a European Central Bank rate meeting next week and we may touch on that as well given how um, the euro dollar has actually been pushing up quite aggressively higher over the course of the last three to four months up 8% since May up 13 or 14% since the beginning of of the year so you know talking about that talking about the weakness of the dollar six successive monthly declines on its trade weighted index and whether or not I think we're due a bit of a rebound in the US dollar so now that um, um, now that we've got um, now that we've got uh, the screen up um, apparently one of my one of one of my users has said that apparently the Bureau for the Labour System statistics is having technical problems so the numbers will come up on the website which means that they may not immediately come out um, as they're released which is a, a little bit of a worry I have to say but um, we'll have to play that by year 130 they're due out they may be they may be slightly delayed so we do need to be prepared for that so thank you very much for that um, live sounds like someone's gone off for the long weekend early sounds like it indeed because obviously what we also have to factor in is the fact that it's a Labor Day holiday in the United States on Monday and that usually marks the end of the summer so um, you know certainly in the context of non-farm payrolls we could have a little bit of positioning adjustment ahead of the long weekend which could also affect the way the markets react in the aftermath of the numbers also later this afternoon we've also got ISM manufacturing, ISM prices paid, ISM new orders, all of those numbers but the, the jobs numbers, the, the, the headline job numbers are going to be represented in the headline number that we're getting out this afternoon. So first and foremost Colin we'll talk about what we're expecting. Um, you're expecting Sounds a sl slightly higher number than 180 so I'll let you uh, go through um, your rationale for your guesstimate. Sure, that sounds fantastic. I had been thinking originally something in the high hundreds, uh, 180 had seemed reasonable to me until I saw the ADP payrolls come out on Wednesday and they were pretty spectacular coming out in the 230s, way above what the street was expecting and what encouraged me even more was the upward revision to July. So what I've decided to, I, that, at that point I bumped up my expectations for non-farm payrolls. They, uh, they've definitely shown a, a lot of strength here. It's showing the robust North American economy continuing through the summer. So I've gone to 225,000 for non-farm payrolls and I'm thinking we could get a uh, about a 20,000 upward revision to last month. Last month was 209,000 for non-farm. The other thing to note was, and we'll talk about this as well a little later, was the spectacular uh, Canadian Q2 GDP numbers that came out uh, yesterday with 4.5% uh, growth over year. Now some of the Q2 Part of that is, of course, related to last year's wildfires, which depressed Q2 in 2016. But still, overall, robust economy. Most of the, a lot of the signs we've seen coming out lately suggest the North American economy has actually been humming along fairly well through the summer until the last week when we've had the uh, the Hurricane Harvey disaster come in and has probably blown a two-week hole in in part of GDP. But uh, but that's its com uh, conversation for later. Uh, your turn, Michael. Okay. Well. I'm going slightly lower than that. I'm going 210, and the rationale for that is ultimately when I've looked on a seasonal basis as to what non-farms and ADP payrolls have done in August, people have suggested that um, the August numbers generally tend to be weak with respect to 
uh, non-farm payrolls. Um, so if we go back to August last year, we can see that the non-farm payrolls for August was 176, but the ADP number was also weak at 140. If we go back another 12 months, we can see the ADP here was 132 in August, but also the non-farm payrolls was a little on the weak side. So, And then if we go back even further to another year, we got 224 in 2014 and 213 in for non-farm payrolls. So ultimately, in August, the two tend to correlate. So I don't expect to see a significant difference in the non-farm payrolls number from the ADP payrolls number that we saw earlier this week. And for that reason alone, I'm going around about 210. Colin could well be right, given that ADP generally tends to come at the lower end and non-farm generally tends to come above it. But that being said, I think we can expect a number in excess of 200,000 and it would be a very big surprise if the number came in below that. That's not to say that that can't happen. Ultimately, correlations are there to be broken. But I think in terms of the bigger, bigger picture, I think the headline number is neither here nor there. And the headline number for me is going to be this particular number that I've got on the screen right now. And that's the wages numbers, the average earnings numbers. I think they could dictate what the dollar does um, over the course of of the next few hours. So let's talk about the dollar because I think in terms of are we going to get any more dollar downside? I think at the moment there is there is some evidence that potentially we could be um, in a bit of a basing pattern for the dollar. Now why do I say that? Because if I look at say for example um, the US economy and I look at the way the market is pricing a rate rise for the rest of this year, if we look at the Bloomberg here we can see that the market is assigning around about 33% probability that the Fed will raise rates between now and December. There's virtually no chance that we're going to get a rate hike in September. So even if we get a decent dollar number, that's not going to change the calculus with respect to September. September is going to be primarily focused on balance sheet reduction. And I think that's probably the best that we can hope for with respect to the September meeting. But certainly in terms and of... I'm still. Go on. Oh, I'm still not convinced that the Fed's even going to do that. I mean, between the, uh, they, they're, they're still staring down the, the barrel of a potential government shutdown mm. uh, in October. Budget negotiations are underway. The U.S. is about to hit its uh, debt ceiling. And then on top of that, Hurricane Harvey has thrown a huge monkey wrench uh, into everything because now they've got to start talking about disaster relief mm. uh, on top of that. Now, some people have, t have taken that as saying, well, Fiscal maybe stimulus. disaster relief will encourage them to... to um, actually get along in, in enough to to push through the debt limit because mm. they it would look politically awful if uh, if de if uh, disaster that's, that's relief gets view. caught up in politics that's that's and, sort of my uh, view colin yeah I, I can see that and and so i think that's one of the reasons we've seen the u.s dollar start to bounce back a little bit mm. this week is uh, so it'll be interesting to see if it, is, is it enough to uh, to encourage the fed to proceed with uh, balance sheet normalization, because then at the same time you say, what's the, what would the Fed be doing tightening when they're dealing with a natural disaster? Sure, absolutely. So it's kind of up in the air, I think. But it's all about positioning as well. You know, and in terms yeah. of the market, if the market's not positioned for an, in, an increase in, in the odds of a Fed tightening, that in itself can pull the dollar off its lows. You know, if that number there moves from 34% to 42%, that will tighten the yield curve. And it will push Agreed. the and it will push the dollar up. So it's not about what the Fed yeah. will or won't do; it's what the market thinks it will do relative to the positioning within the market. Um, and for, for me, at the moment, you've had six yep. successive down moves in the U, you know in, in in the U.S. dollar index, and ultimately there needs to be at some point a little bit of what I would call um, positioning adjustment. And ultimately, we're not mm -hmm. really seeing that at the moment. And certainly, looking at the way the candlesticks have been pricing. If we look at the dollar index, we can see a little bit of a hammer there on the dollar index. What we do need to do is break this little downtrend line that we're currently coming in um, from the highs that we saw earlier in August. But ultimately, um, while I think we could squeeze back to around about 119.50, 119.80 in the short to medium term, this evening's star reversal here would appear to suggest that maybe um, the short positions could be in the process of getting a little bit squeezed. So I think in terms of the actual overall number, a decent number here, dollar number, 
could prompt a little bit of downside risk on euro dollar and a little bit of a squeeze in the US dollar. Absolutely, and especially Michael, when you can when you look at it in the, in the context of other markets, you also have a similar pattern. So with this evening star in the euro dollar, you've also got a buying climax and and a bull trap where you peaked up above 120 and then you got knocked back in that. And of course, that peak was also a shooting star. Mm. You've all, you've got a similar pattern with gold where it had popped above 1320 to 1325 got knocked back you're also looking at the the the, the reverse of that uh, the mirror image is the uh, more potential morning star in morning star in the next with the hammer you pointed out where it got pounded down um, under 92 and then and then popped back up so you've got three kind of markets that are all showing very similar uh, technical kind of patterns emerging but also if we look at dollar cad um, the the weakness of the dollar against the Canadian dollar has been quite marked since May but now we're approaching a big 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 support level it's the 200-week moving average, but also we've got a very long-term trend line from the lows in 2012. So we're lo I'm looking at that at the moment, and we're looking at those lows that we saw in July. We're at a very, very key level on the Canadian dollar. So the big question we really need to be asking around about 124 is what's going to drive it below 124? Um, given how much in terms of gains we've seen in the Canadian dollar, over the course of the past three weeks, and given the fact that well, it's a U.S. It, holiday, it looked like we had a massive double bottom for, forming here in dollar CAD, and it was just starting to pop up off of it, mm. and the, until we got that spectacular Canadian GDP number yesterday. Mm. Now the Bank of Canada is meeting next week on Wednesday. Uh, nobody's really expecting at this point that they'll raise rates two meetings in a row, but most I think that there's a lot of people will be looking to the statement to see are they going to hint at a second rate increase this year, whether it's in October or December. It's important to remember the Bank of Canada in, since the financial crisis has moved, in rate, moved rates twice. So in 2010, they raised rates twice. In 2015, they cut rates twice. So now here in 2017, they've raised rates once. They'll probably raise rates one more time to get it back up to 1%, and then, and then they may or may not stop. But at least initially, people will figure that they'll probably go one more time and then stop. So that's going to be the next thing excuse me for the next few days is, is is people are going to be speculating on what is the bank of canada going to say at its meeting next week given these uh, incredibly strong uh, beyond anybody's expectations gdp report so so keep an eye on 124 dollar cad keep an eye on around 119 and a half euro dollar and the dollar is looking a little bit weak at the moment ahead of these numbers which suggests to me perhaps there's a little bit of a a, a little bit of positioning adjustments going on at the moment looking at the cable you know people people are always beating up the pound at the moment i'm not one of them um i do like to be slightly contrarian however and that can be a bit dangerous but ultimately i still expect the pound to try and head back towards 130 as long as we stay above this series of lows around just below 129 i think the buyer still remains to the upside and we can certainly see that in the context of this move here but ultimately i also think that looking at euro sterling and colin we talked about potential reversals in the euro. We saw a significant reversal on the big daily one. euro sterling there. Now, the big level on that is 91.80 yep. on the downside, 92.40.50 on the top side. So I, do, I, I think I would be sort of be a bit reluctant to be you know, overly long euro sterling at this point in time. If we go above 92.50, then we could well squeeze back. But ultimately, I would expect on a break below 91.80 for us to push down towards 90. 40. Let's quickly do dollar yen. And if you looked on that uh, quickly, the the uh, stochastics rolled back under 80 as well. That's yep. a uh, correction signal, and the RSI has rolled back under 70 on that pair. Yep, indeed. Dollar yen. Um, you know, you can throw a blanket over that. It's well bid around about 108 and a half between 108 and a half and 108, 108, 108 and a half. But it's also well offered around about 111 um, through these series of peaks through here. So at the moment, if I look at the dollar yen. It's looking a little bit soft, but looking at these series of lows through today, I think it'll you know, be surprised. 244, 244. It's just been released by CNBC for non-farm payrolls. But it's early. It's early. Well, someone's just flashed up 244, so that's a decent number. And as, as I suspected, it might be. And the, the, the dollar is heading higher. But CNBC, I think, got a little bit premature on the older uh, release. And they've, they've released it as 244. Let's see what actually happens on the actual countdown. 
What? 156? You're having a laugh. That's bizarre. Wow, that's really low. That is way off. Well done, CNBC. That's all I can say. I'm One just... interesting thing from this is, so it's mostly, it's, so the non-firm's 156, the, pri the, the private's 165, which was close to yeah. 172. But the interesting one, manufacturing up 36K mm. and uh, or versus Street 8K and manufacturing upward revision last month to 26K. Donald Trump's going to be pretty happy about that. Yeah, but he's not going to be particularly happy about the headline, right? And um, no, and the we'll wages and the wages and talk about manufacturing and the wages is disappointing as well. Well, yes, I'll held at two point five. Yeah, held at two point five, and we're expecting an increase to two point six. So that's very dollar yeah. negative. Um, so we're probably going to see dollar yen head back towards the lows. That is, uh, there's there's going to be a stewards on that. I mean, CNBC for releasing two forty four. I mean, I've got it in front of me. What I can't the heck believe was that? it. Did you see that? Correction. Now they've released a correction. Non-farm <laughs> payrolls increased by 156 in August versus 180. Someone's got Quite fired. Someone's getting fired in the morning. Or someone's getting fired now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the dollar CAD's dropped through that 124 level. I mean, that's just gone 123.79. Um, so where do we wow. go from here? So basically what that's that does is... a major break for dollar CAD. Yeah, major break for dollar CAD. But more importantly... We're probably going to head back towards 120 on euro dollar on the back of that number. And yeah, sure enough, we have. So what we really need to see now on euro dollar is for us to close above 120 to suggest a move back to, towards around about 123. So guys, I can only apologize for saying 244, but I was only quoting what CNBC released on my iPad alert. And... Um, yeah, I'm getting all egg over my face, but the markets thought thought the same as well, didn't they? I mean, dollar yen suddenly shot yeah, up. Yeah, the other interesting thing: the nine firm last month revised down twenty thousand instead of up. The uh, this is a huge divergence between between ADP, ADP and nine firm. Mm. Yeah. No, absolutely. But if you look at the change in the private payrolls for the you know, we've we've seen we've seen a bit of a revision up there as well. So no, we haven't. It's been revised down. So this down slightly. Down slightly. Yeah, yeah it's two oh two. I was reading it wrong. I was reading the wrong column. So yeah, I mean, basically, what we're looking at now is it's unlikely the dollar's going to go too much higher today. And uh, I think, as I suspected, the pound's going to head back towards one thirty. Um, but I was predicating that on the basis of a slightly weaker euro sterling, not. Um, a, uh, a weaker dollar so um, we're really pretty much back to the drawing board but certainly I think in terms of the ECB um, Mario Draghi's not going to be thinking uh, the US jobs numbers because it doesn't make his job any easier for next week certainly in terms of trying to limit limit the gains in the euro which we've seen over the course of the past um, over the past few days so let's look at gold because especially the since the, um, the the European economy has been humming along and one thing I did find really intriguing this morning was that if you looked at the uh, the PMI reports, one thing that I gleaned out of was, one, obviously the UK was very good, but Italy was good, Greece was good, and Greece's GDP was good. These these lagging countries in, mm. in Europe that have been dragging on everything, some of them are starting to look like they may be starting to get some traction this summer, and that that, uh, that uh, uh, puts more pressure on, on Draghi to, reach, to change his thinking as well. It does, but also, yeah, you can look, you can look at the PMI, the manufacturing PMI for Greece, which came in at 52.5, which is a nine-year high. And that's all nice. You know, it's great and everything else. But tell that to the 35, 40% youth unemployed in that country True. at the moment. Um, yes. And the similar sort of amount that are in Italy and Spain. You know, this is what I would call, you know, it is, it is a jobs recovery, but the Spanish unemployment rate is still 18%. And the Greek unemployment rate, headline unemployment rate, is still 21%. Okay, it's down from 27 and 22 respectively, but it's still way too high, and it's still Agreed well on that. and it's still well below the EU level, EU unemployment rate. It's still well above the levels it was prior to the 2007 financial crisis when it was around about six or seven percent. It's still 9.1. So, yeah. um, you know, you can you can talk talk about 
really good manufacturing PMIs, services PMIs and what have you, and it's all very nice. But uh, there's still an awful lot of young people who don't have jobs. True. Um, and that is a problem. Gold has actually gone up on those numbers, which is not really too much of a surprise because ultimately what it does is it means that um, the likelihood of a Fed rate rise is diminished further. And ultimately, I think it could actually change the discussion around tapering or re balance sheet reduction, perhaps. Well, you know, that, it's, it for gold today. it's a weak jobs number. It's a weak wages number. And PCE earlier this week was 1.4%. So where's you know where's where's the where's the wage inflation, where's the price inflation? Now you might see it at the back end of this year because of gasoline prices, perhaps, which would put upward pressure on inflation. But that's the wrong kind of inflation, <laughs> especially if you're a consumer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And on top of that, the Fed will probably sit there and it will probably say the the spike in gasoline was temporary. And ignore it. Transitory. That's usually what they do in these kind of cases. I think, yeah. yeah, the word is transitory, mate. Like most inflation. Oh, yeah, it'll pass. Yeah, well, of course it does. It always passes eventually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. So let's look at this. Let's look at the key levels on Dow's back above, but Dow's above 22,000. And the likelihood is we're going to head back to 2485 on the S&P. I can't see too much really to stop that from happening. The um, oscillators looking positive. We've broken above that 2450. We've broken above the highs that we saw in mid-August. So it looks like we're going to head back towards around about 2480, which was the highs that we saw in early August. We look at the Dow. Once again, fairly positive for the Dow. Probably going to head back towards uh, the highs that we saw in August, around about 22,100. Um, this high here. Uh, again, can't really see any reason as to why we can't go higher there. Um, and can you pull up the NASDAQ, Michael? Sure. Look at the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ has broken out over 6,000 today to a new all-time high. So when the markets open in the US in just under an hour, um, we will see a new record high on the NASDAQ, 100. So, yeah, I mean, where do you go? I mean, look at that. Look at that rise there. And we've got an Apple um, product launch on September the 11th, Monday week, 12th, 12th, Tuesday week. So, but I think most people, yeah. I mean, most of that's been leaked anyway. So we know what's coming: a new iPhone 8, a new Apple Watch, and a new Apple TV. Apparently, what I want to know is whether or not they're going to bring out a new iPad Mini. Because if they do, I know what I'm getting my missus for a, her birthday. Um, right. So, German DAX. Let's have a quick look at that because we've been in a downtrend for quite some time and um, the high euro is not going to help in that regard. Look at this. This has been one of my favourite charts for the past two or three months because every time the euro has gone up, the DAX has managed to roll into a little bit of a resistance level. And even though we are up today, we're not in any way close to pushing through that resistance line from those peaks that we saw in June. Um, so I think if the euro continues to remain where it is, up near towards 120, it's going to be very difficult for the DAX to break above these particular levels here. Certainly in terms of what the FTSE's done and the, and, the, and the rise in the pound, we've seen the FTSE also roll back off the back of those numbers, starting to roll back from the 7460 level here. You know, and this is this is the this is the problem with the markets at the moment. Huge amounts of divergence with respect to what European markets are doing and US markets are doing. US markets love a weak dollar, but they also don't mind a too strong a dollar. So it's a bit of a Goldilocks scenario for <laughs> US markets at the moment. Um, unlike European markets, which I think are much more susceptible to the value of the euro. And I think that in that context, next week's ECB meeting is going to be very, very important. Um, we've seen 13, 14% rise in the value of the euro this year. Now, we're told, ultimately, that you know we shouldn't worry too much about it. But these are the same people who are having apoplexy about the fact that the pound lost 15% of its value in the wake of the Brexit vote. We were told that was very, very bad. And yet we see a 14-15% rise in the value of the euro and say, oh, it doesn't matter. Well, you can't have it both ways. 
It's either very, very bad, very, very good, or something in between, or it doesn't really matter that much. So, um, looking looking at this, 74.60, a decent level of resistance on the FTSE, depending on the value of the pound. DAX, pretty much the same. Any, any, anything near 120, it's going to be difficult for the DAX to really push higher. Um, um, and, and the same really applies with respect to um, the rest of it, really. I think dollar yen, we've talked about that. It's in a range. I think it's unlikely to break out of it. And now the, and now the dollar's suddenly gone bid. Euro dollars just dropped. Any any idea why? Hmm. Yep. I haven't seen anything new. Let me just pop up the. Uh, ECB is said to see chance QE plan not fully ready until December. Can you tweet that? December. There we go. There we go. Yep. Yeah, people. I think we I think people were thinking October. I don't think yeah. anybody was expecting December. September anyway. No. No. So, so now December. So they're stalling. They're stalling. And you see seen the reaction. <laughs> God, I, I love foreign exchange. <laughs> so that's the reason for that. Um, any questions, ladies and gents, while we're on? Um, we've still got three or four minutes to go. Um, any questions on... Should we should we do um, crude oil? Quite amazing how that... Sure, let's do crude oil. Let's talk about crude oil and, and gasoline. When you... Uh, we've, had the, we've had Hurricane Harvey has gone through... Now, and this is this is a really, really big, big disa natural disaster. Usually, when hurricanes hit North America, they usually hit the coast. They 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 rush inland and then they dissipate fairly quickly into into just rain. But th this time around, what happened was the uh, a high pressure system basically kept the eye of the storm sitting right on the coast, uh, just in and out of inland, and and basically just kept pouring rain on Houston for the better part of a week. And uh, and there's just huge amounts of flooding. There's a lot more and extensive damage than you usually get from a hurricane. And that's what's and that's why we saw as the week progressed the natural gas price on the near contract really spiked the uh, the farther out months have not sp come up a, to the same extent and so that's uh, that's normal that's that's telling you the market's expecting a short term squeeze in gasoline prices but that when in time things will go back to normal the uh, crude oil price on the other hand we saw going down during the week and then it popped yesterday the uh, the uh, the crude oil. What, what's happened was people were saying, well, the crude oil, most of the production's inland, unaffected, but there's no way of getting it down to the to the refineries that are all on the Gulf Coast. And the problem is not only the refineries themselves being shut in, but the uh, the pipelines and and the ports, because a number of something like 11 ports along the Gulf Coast have also ports along the Gulf Coast have also been shut in. Those may take a little while to get going. The one thing that might save a refinery is that we're heading into the time of year when they retool and. And, and do fixes to plants anyways as they switch over driving driving season in north america ends this weekend the the peak uh, peak demand for gasoline and uh and so then we start heading towards retooling season when the refineries start getting ready to switch production over from uh gasoline to heating oil and getting ready for the winter so that's a uh, so we're at a point where refinery production usually comes off anyways but uh but because of some of the damage done it may well it, it still remains to be seen how long production is going to be offline some of the uh, the western refineries were start that were starting to come back some of the eastern refineries because the storm kind of went northeast into louisiana are still shut down so it's still up in the air when this happens and what, what you'll be looking at is the inventory reports for probably the next three weeks at least are going to be all over the place and it remains to be seen how much the street's going to pay attention to those given the circumstances that uh, that it's going to be wildly distorted because of this uh, this massive uh, storm and huge natural disaster yeah indeed i mean i think that's probably why the inventories are still high which is why gasoline gasoline has spiked because they obviously can't convert those inventories into actual gasoline but that's right. You know, there's still there's still quite high levels, and once they get that back online, you'll see it come back down again. Which is also explains why Brent hasn't come down, and uh, WTI has slightly different supply and demand dynamics, which is why the the spreads have widened out between WTI and Brent. So anyway, yeah. um, unless anyone has any other questions about potential what's happening next week or on anything that we haven't covered. Um, We'll um, we'll wind them up. We'll wind this this particular payrolls story up. Um, David has a webinar on Monday, 
at 12.15 if you want to sign up for that when he previews the week ahead. Um, otherwise, um, Colin and I will like to thank you for uh, attending this rather interesting non-farm payrolls report where CNBC leaked the numbers beforehand and the numbers were completely wrong. Um, but I suppose, hopefully, um, no one lost uh, too much money as a result of that. And then, of course, the ECB came out and suggested that they won't have a table plan ready until December. So all, all fun and games. Um, I've been asked about the yen. Uh, what, dollar yen? Euro yen? Um, you know, what, what yen cross would you like me to um, talk about, sir? Or just the yen in general? Let's talk about let's talk about dollar yen because ultimately that's not going anywhere at the moment. I think it's well supported around about 108.20 and it's well off at around about 111. And at the moment that's just range trading and I think it's in the sweet spot, I think, in terms of where the Bank of Japan would like it, um, certainly in, in the context of where the Federal Reserve would like it. If you look at this dollar yen chart, since the beginning of the year, we've traded in a 600 point range. So I think that pretty much sums it up. Um, you know, we're, we're towards the lower end of that. Um, I can't really see any reason to get too excited about that. A euro yen might be a slightly different story, given given um, those um, comments from the um, ECB. That could be. Um, in the process of potentially topping out. Certainly, I think there's potential for a little bit. I mean, is this a triple top, Colin? I mean, it's a sloping top because you've got peaks in July, peaks in August. and Yeah, that looks that's starting to look like a triple top to me. And I think what you really want to keep an eye on is 130. If we see that start to roll back under 130 or you see that something like the stochastic start to roll down again, mm. then yeah, you'd be looking at a triple top. While we're talking about the euro, I've been, I've been sitting, I've been uh, looking at this minute chart on the euro US dollar, and we had the spike, mm. and it got as high as 180, or sorry, 11980 when that uh, ECB announcement hit mm. the wires, and uh, and so it's starting to look to me like the uh, the ECB is trying to defend 120. It looks like we it. had it. We spiked yeah. up above it a couple of days ago, and now as soon as we got anywhere near it, boom! The, EU, the EU is out trying to talk it down in in some way, and it looks to me like that might be their uh, their trigger point where they're just saying enough is enough. Well, trying let's to, have a uh, let's, let's have a look down. at but this. We'll see. Let's have a look at this 9180 level because I've identified that as a little bit of a, a trigger point on euro sterling, and we're right on it. We're right on it mm -hmm. right now. So. You know, I think if if we get a little bit of a rebound in euro sterling, um, certainly wouldn't be looking to, um, you know, look to sell it here because ultimately you're on the lows of the day. But if you get a rebound on euro sterling back to around about 92, 20 or 30, might might be worth might be worth looking to to, to sell into that sort of area with a, with a fairly tight stop on it because I think the direction of travel does appear to be clear in terms of the euro and the and the ECB's views of it. Ultimately, um, you know, a fourteen percent rise in such a short space of time is very difficult to manage in terms of currency exposure and currency hedging for European companies. And while they may be able to hedge on a slightly longer term basis, these shorter term moves are slightly more problematic. So I think they want to smooth it. They want to smooth it out. So I think as a result of that we may see a little bit of a rebound off this sort of ninety one seventy five eighty area. And head back towards around about just above 92, perhaps. But we'll see. It's difficult. To, it's difficult to know in this sort of environment at the moment. But it does appear to be the case that I think it's going to be very, very difficult for people to be longer euros heading into this weekend and with the ECB coming up next week. Aussie dollar. Just been asked about Aussie dollar. So let's have a quick look at that. That 200-week moving average is proving to be problematic for Aussie dollar. Um, I'm looking looking at this chart now and seeing there's a good barrier around about 80. We've seen two attempts on a weekly basis to move above the 200 week moving average. Both attempts have failed. So I think as long as we close, as long as we're unable to close above the 200 week moving average, then ultimately I think the potential for a higher Aussie is going to be fairly constrained. And let's also remind yourselves or remind ourselves, ladies and gents, it's an RBA meeting next week, and I can't imagine that the RBA will want to talk the Aussie up. I think they have concerns that it will be 
um, it will it will be uncomfortable for them, shall we say? So, RBA have a meeting. I think it's Tuesday. Is it, Colin? Yes. So, yes. So RBA are meeting next week. Bank of Canada are meeting next week. The European Central Bank are meeting next week. So you've got a you've got you know quite a few central banks who could potentially um, give rather conflicting stories. So maybe Aussie CAD's a bit of a player. Uh, yeah, and uh, the other thing with the Aussies in particular is this: uh, we had this up until a few minutes ago. We had the Aussie and the CAD both sitting at about 80 cents US. I think the uh, the Aussies in particular will probably try and defend that, uh, try and put some kind of headwind in around that level. I don't think they want it going above 80 yeah. in any uh, in any meaningful way. Just like I was mentioning earlier with the ECB at 120, I don't think the Aussies want to go above 80. And the Bank of Canada may find themselves uncomfortable with it as well. But they still see. I, I'm I'm, deba I'm I'm kind of torn between the, you know, are they going to want it to kind of hang around 80 now that we've blasted through it? Or and how committed are they going to be to another rate hike with the with the way the dollar has been climbing? Sure. Okay. So that's they're they're going to be they're going to find themselves between a rock and a hard place as well with the uh, w wanting to raise rates and and seeing the loony go going through the roof. No, indeed, mate. Indeed. Okay, dokie. All right. Well, um, unless anyone has got any other questions, um, hopefully. Um, that that's that's it for this month. Um, obviously, we'll be here same time, same place in October, first Friday in October for the uh, September jobs report. Otherwise, um, Colin and I would like to thank you for your attendance and uh, um, wish you luck in uh, all your trading um, for the rest of the day, and have a good weekend. Have a great day trading, everyone, and a great long weekend for everyone in North America.